Hello, and welcome to the Panthera TV live session on introducing key wildcat species. My name is Kelly Carton, and I am the lead integrated content strategist at Panthera. This episode will highlight Panthera's efforts to reestablish viable populations of four species within their native ranges, tigers, Arabian birds, lions, and jaguars. We're hosting this session in honor of Giving Tuesday and our end of year campaign, Catalyst. Initiatives like the ones we'll discuss today are catalyzing change for wild cats. We have a fantastic panel of scientists lined up and we expect a lively discussion. If you have a question, please share it as a comment and we will try to answer it at the end. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Frederick Linnae, Panthera CEO and President. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Fred Lonay, and I'm the CEO of Pantera. But before being joining uh, Pantera, I was for many years in my career to uh, animal and plant reintroduction, which is the topic we are uh, highlighting today. And we'll try to make a, a lively session using the work we are doing on several species of cats throughout the world and illustrate uh, the issues of reintroduction of large carnivores. I would introduce my fellow panelists uh, now, and I will uh, start by Phil and ask if they could introduce themselves and say a little bit about the species they are working on. Phil. Yeah, thank you very much, Fred, and uh, hello to everybody. Yeah, so I'm uh, Phil Pencho, uh, Panthera's Regional Director for West Africa and Central Africa. And uh, I'm speaking um, to you today from uh, the country of Gabon in Central Africa, where I started my career on uh, cat conservation um, now a good 22 years ago, working first on leopard, but then gradually moving uh, to other species as well, um, including the lion, um, on which um, I focused a lot of the survey work uh, I then contact conducted with partners in uh, many countries in Central Africa and West Africa. And the topic of our uh, discussion today, the reintroduction is sadly very prominent in the discussions we lead today with some of these countries where we visited, where we surveyed uh, for lion, because many of the sites in West Africa and Central Africa that used to have lions, uh, for some sites as recent as, as uh, five to 10 years ago, have now lost their lines and with some of these governments uh, um, we're now discussing uh, potential plans to reintroduce lines they are so very relevant in the context of this discussion today thanks phil john hi everyone thanks for joining today i'm john goodrich panthera's chief scientist and tiger program director and i've been working in big cat conservation since about 1995. i've been uh, somewhat involved with reintroductions um, with tigers. You know, tigers exist in only about 4% of their historic range. So there's 96% of their historic range left over the, that we might consider re reintroductions in. And some of the work that I did about 20 years ago was translocating, um, rehabilitating and translocating some tigers that uh, some of them were orphan cubs, some of them had, had minor injuries that needed to be taken into captivity until those injuries healed and then released back into the wild. And we did that work that ultimately led to um, the reintroduction of tigers into a, a new area of their historic range in the Russian Far East. Um, so that's my, been my involvement in reintroduction. I look forward to talking to you more about it today. Thank you, John. Alison? Hello, good morning, um, good afternoon. I'm Alison Devlin, uh, Deputy Director of Panthera's Jaguar Program. It's a bittersweet promotion to the title as we recently lost Dr. Howard Quigley, um, who is Director of the Jaguar Program. I've worked with Howard and our Jaguar team for the better part of 15 years, um, first doing my master's in Belize, um, having my start first at the Bronx Zoo and then working in Belize, studying jaguars, and then in the Pantanal uh, for my PhD, and now more recently range-wide within our Jaguar Corridor Initiative. And with jaguars, we 
still have about 50% of their native range intact. And that's where our Jaguar Corridor Initiative is aiming to prevent this fragmentation and we can be proactive in conserving jaguars. There are some projects from collaborators working on reintroduction, but for our teams, we're mainly working on maintaining connectivity. So it'll be an interesting discussion today. Thanks, Fred. Thank you, Edison. And finally, Gareth. Hello, everyone. I'm Gareth Mann. I am the director of Panthera's Leopard program. Um, I've been working on leopards for about 13 years now, and I'm relatively new to the to the field of animal reintroduction. It's not something that we've we've had to really consider to a great extent um, in in Southern Africa, where we've done a lot of our work so far. But more recently, we started the project on Arabian leopards, which have lost about 99% of their historic home range. And so, and in many of these places, they are, are completely gone. So there are large tracts of land that are potentially available that don't have any lepers at the moment. And the only way we're likely to get them back is by actually reintroducing them in future. So yeah, hoping to have a really good discussion today and to, and to learn and hopefully contribute to this. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. So as you see, we've got an expert in uh, four of the big cat species. Uh, covering a number of continents from South and Central America to Africa, Asia, uh, and uh, the Middle East. So, as my panelists have mentioned, we hear very often reintroduction and translocation. So, before we go further, it, I think it's important to uh, agree on what we are talking about because these, these terms are not interchangeable. So, basically, translocation is a generic term and is the human-mediated movement of living organism from one area with release in another. And that is basically very generic and it, irrespective of the aim and goal of this movement of animals between places. Reintroduction, however, is the intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it has been extirpated and disappeared. The reintroduction aim to re-establish a viable population of the focal species within its indigenous range. So here you've got a notion of intentional and the notion of historical range, indigenous range, and a place where that species have disappeared. So now the key question for us and something we are all uh, struggling with sometime or working on is when is it appropriate to reintroduce a species and in particular a large apex carnivore? And if we have reintroduction and when is it appropriate, what are the alternatives when reintroduction are actually not appropriate or not necessary? So We'll go through all the panelists to get their take about this question and within the context they knew and the species they are working on, which all share a lot of similarity, but also a fundamental difference in terms of their biology, but also their conservation status today. So we will start by Phil now and, uh, uh, and, and, and the lion. I mean, lion is widespread throughout Africa, but they are very stark differences of lion conservation status depending of where we are actually looking at. So Phil, what, what do you think? Where, where do you think is the most, when is it appropriate for lion to be reintroduced? Yeah, thank you very much, Fred. And uh, yeah, I think that's a very important introduction also to, to those listening. Uh, because as you say, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of, of what, what, what one could do. Um, Alison uh, mentioned connectivity as well in the Jaguar example, and uh, we are also working in some areas where just by reducing the threats to lions and making the landscape more permeable for lions, I mean, we hope to have natural re-immigration into some of these areas that they lost to avoid having doing, uh, uh, yeah, very sort of like hands-on interventions 
like uh, taking uh, an animal or species somewhere and then introducing it into or reintroducing it in an area where the, the uh, species was present. Uh, so part of the historical range, but where um, maybe the local wildlife uh, might have become, become too naive to, uh, naive to lions uh, because the, the, the top predator, as you said, was absent from the system for a long time and where also communities have lost the habit of uh, living with, with this uh, large carnivore. Uh, lions, as we all know, as a species that can be very conflict prone, if there's livestock raising in an area, then it also can be a, a thorny issue. And so um, we have to weigh all these different um, options, uh, basically, uh, discuss this also with our government partners and then see um, what can be done here yeah, also to attenuate um, the threats in, in a remaining line range and then potentially foster natural re-immigration uh, rather than, than going to, yeah, so like more hands-on approaches like, like uh, uh, reintroducing the species actively. But uh, often we reach a limit to what is possible naturally. Um, because in, in West Africa, for example, there also uh, the lion has lost 99% uh, um, of its former range. Uh, there are now currently four sites only where lions retain, uh, remain, excuse me. And um, uh, there are entire vast stretches, I mean, uh, 2,000 by 2,000 kilometers across. Um, if we look at countries like Ghana, Ivory Coast, that have lost their lions in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, but where natural re-immigration is uh, most likely never going to happen. I mean, there are just too many people in between these uh, remaining protected areas uh, in those two countries. Um, there are two national parks we can cite, uh, Mole in Ghana, uh, Como in uh, Ivory Coast, um, where we conducted surveys for lions um, in 2009, 2010, and, and, and documented that lions had only just disappeared from these systems. But now they're gone, you know, they're, 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 these areas are too far away from uh, neighboring countries that still have lines for natural immigration. And so they're currently, we are discussing, invited by the government, by the wildlife authorities, um, uh, uh, yeah, evaluating the possibilities um, of line reintroduction and um, um, I think you know if we really want to be serious about about uh, helping uh, wildlife authorities to restore um, lines across larger parts of their range, sometimes we come into these situations where that active reintroduction is just the only the only possible solution. And so there currently are a few sites I mentioned them: uh, Mole in Ghana and and Ivory Coast, where we have started to work towards establishing uh, feasibility uh, studies. Um, working with the wildlife sector, but also starting to work with communities. One example is also here in Gabon to evaluate if it's feasible to bring them in, uh, evaluate what has to be done to do it safely. Um, and, um, and our most advanced work is currently in Gabon, um, where we have done quite a few of these steps and are um, um, now yeah, in, in the last preparation stages of bringing lines back into one landscape, uh, which is the Bateki landscape in southeast Gabon. Thanks, and I think it's interesting because a uh, lion in the in the world of, of Bikas is probably the, the, the species which is uh, the most translocated. Uh, not always for, for conservation purposes, but I think you have a wealth of experience and, and practice uh, between game management and, and protected area of, of moving lions between different areas. Uh, what is also... What, what we want to, to see there is the contrast with Tiger, for example. And, and, and John, we've, we've got recently good news about Tigers uh, with uh, the latest uh, red list assessment, which seems to indicate that there are an increase in number of Tiger individuals. But I think Tiger illustrates very, very well where and when actually reintroduction can actually be a, a, a useful and necessary conservation action. Uh, if you if you can uh, elaborate yeah, from you your experience with what I, what I try to, to to actually say there. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Um, yeah, we have had good news. Tiger numbers do seem to be increasing right now after uh, a lot of effort over the past ten to fifteen years to increase tiger numbers in in specific areas. But what we haven't seen is an increase in tiger range. 
And indeed, as their, their numbers have been increasing over the past 10 years or so, range has actually decreased. And there are right now about a million square kilometers of vacant tiger habitat out there. That's good tiger habitat that doesn't have any tigers in it because they've been poached out and or their prey is, has been poached out. So there's an awful lot of area out there into which we could consider reintroducing tigers. Now, as Phil, Philip just talked about for lions, it's always going to be better if you can establish connectivity between areas and have natural immigration repopulate an area and not have to consider reintroduction. But for tigers, there's an awful lot of areas where that's never going to happen. It's just too well developed, um, too much human development for, for tigers to move through or for us to have any hope of creating tiger habitat to establish that connectivity. Um, so considering areas where reintroduction would be a must to repopulate tigers, there, there's two, or two countries right now that have reintroduction plans. One is Kazakhstan and one is, is Cambodia. And let's talk about Cambodia as a, as a good example. I think one of the most important considerations before doing a reintroduction is making sure that the problem that caused the extinction, the local extinction of tigers or any cat from the area, making sure that problem is solved. So in the case of tigers in Cambodia, it's massive poaching of, of tiger prey and of tigers themselves has, has wiped everything out. That problem hasn't been solved yet. There are still, in many of the sites in Cambodia, um, tens of thousands of snares per year being pulled out of these, uh, of these areas. Poaching is so rampant. So we can't really consider reintroduction into those sites at this time. But as Fred brought up in his initial question, well, what are the alternatives? Um, and that's a really important question. So for Cambodia, we don't give up on the idea of, of, of reintroduction. We put together a really well thought out reintroduction plan. And the first steps in that plan are to stop the poaching in Cambodia. And then second step, recover prey populations so tigers have something to eat when you reintroduce them. And only after those two steps have been completed successfully can you then reintroduce tigers. Thanks, John. That's, that's a very in interesting uh, point, and, and, and we can come back on, on, on that a little bit later when we explore the, uh, the alternatives. But now let's turn to uh, Addison, where working with probably the, the large cat, which has the, probably the most extensive quasi-continuous distribution range, and where actually the uh, the, uh, the, the, the problematic of conservation uh, action is actually somewhat different. So, Alison, please tell us a little bit more of how you see the, the need for reintroduction in a, on a species like jaguar. Sure, thank you, Fred. Um, first, we, in an ideal world, would want to avoid a situation where a population would get to that degree of needing reintroduction. And with jaguars, we have that opportunity. Um, as mentioned earlier, we can be proactive and maintain connectivity Jaguars currently range over 18 countries in Latin America from northern Mexico through northern Argentina. There are some individuals that have dispersed into the southwestern United States, and they're likely from the northernmost population in Mexico. So there are cases where jaguars, other felids around the world, have the potential to naturally recolonize areas where they may have been locally extirpated. If we can maintain habitat and a healthy prey base, that will support those individuals. And as long as those dispersers have safe passage to leave their natal home range and establish that new territory, then we can support a natural recolonization. Um, working on reintroduction, there are two countries within their range where they have been extirpated. And then there are other portions within range countries where they've been locally extirpated. Um, some of our collaborators have worked to reintroduce jaguars in Argentina, for example, where they were locally extinct for over 70 years. And that's something where they may be isolated from other dispersing populations. So bringing that reintroduced set of jaguars would reestablish the populations. But then once that is established, we need to ensure connectivity so those productive individuals can then leave and maintain genetic connectivity. And the idea with the Jaguar Corridor Initiative 
isn't that you would have a single individual moving from Mexico to Argentina, but instead ensuring genetic and physical connectivity throughout that range so that we won't end up having situations with isolated populations and local extirpation. So again, we need to maintain intact habitat. We need to maintain a healthy prey base for jaguars, which also ties into them being useful indicators for biodiversity. And then we also need to address the threats. So as John had mentioned, before a reintroduction can occur or even to prevent the need for reintroduction, we need to mitigate threats. The main threats for most wild felids are habitat loss and direct killing, typically because of human wildlife conflict. And that's usually in retaliation for loss of livestock. And retaliation, especially the way that we approach it within Jaguar range, livestock are a livelihood, something that families rely on for their hmm. family. So it's understandable and approaching it from that of promoting coexistence and mitigating that threat often can resolve that issue. Um, we are seeing an increase in the threat of illegal trade. We also need to ensure that protected areas and key populations continue to be protected and support that coexistence in working landscapes outside of protected areas. So again, if we have the opportunity to mitigate those threats before a population is locally extirpated, that's really the goal. And in conservation, if we do need to reintroduce, that's typically because it is locally extirpated and that becomes almost a last step to bring a species back where it should be occurring naturally. Thanks, Alison. And I think we, we will go now to, I think, nearly the other extreme we, we, with Gareth and the, uh, the Arabian leopard, which is probably the most endangered uh, species of big cats, probably with less than 200 individuals left in its uh, former historical range. So then the problematic is certainly very, very different from the, the one we have for, for jaguar, tiger, or, or, or lion. So, so Garrett, in, in your case, uh, I think, it's, is it safe to say that reintroduction is maybe the only option? I think Garrett is trying to speak, but we don't hear him. Uh, sorry, sorry, Fred. Um, apologies, yeah. apologies okay. for that. Here, here. Um, sorry, I, I just I just missed your question at the end there. Um, I, I had a little internet connectivity issue. No, I would say in, in the case of Arabian leopard, is it safe to say, uh, compared to uh, jaguar, tiger, and lion, that reintroduction is probably the last the last option? Uh, yes, Fred, I think, I think it's really the only option to be, to be quite honest. Um, across most of its range, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, they've, they have been extirpated. Um, they're currently restricted to a, a population in southern Oman in the Dofar Mountains. Um, we think there are still some in Yemen, but because of the, the conflict there, it's very hard to know how many leopards are left there. And we have done a lot of work over the past couple of years looking for leopards in, in Saudi Arabia and haven't found any evidence of, of them still being present, um, which, which doesn't mean that they, they're necessarily all gone. They, I think leopards in that habitat, because it's so dry, they would always have had very large home ranges just to get enough food to eat. Um, they would have to forage over a very big area and so it's, it's always going to be difficult to, to find them. And even with modern methods like camera traps, um, you, it's still possible that, that you can maybe miss them. But we are quite confident in saying that whatever leopards are left are probably just a few isolated individuals in Saudi Arabia and definitely not a viable population that can survive without being supplemented somehow. Now, in an ideal world, we would be able to restore natural connectivity to the populations that are still surviving, but they are a very long way away. 
um, in, in Yemen and Oman. Um, there's obviously all kinds of, of issues with, with uh, conflicts as well, which makes it difficult. And the, the, the other challenge with, with Arabian lepers, which is something that, that's very different from uh, many other areas where I've worked, is that leopards and people compete for habitats in, in a very direct sense. Um, in many parts of the world, wildlife can survive in mountainous areas because they are less, they're, they're less attractive for development. It's expensive and difficult to build there. But in, in Saudi Arabia, it's the complete opposite because mountains are very desirable for people. It's a very arid country. There's more water around mountains. It's cooler. It's nicer to live up near the top of a mountain. So what that means is that there's a very strong um, human-induced pressure on, on leopard habitat, and there aren't many refuges available for the leopards. So it's very hard in that context to maintain connectivity um, between areas. So our best bet is probably to try and find large areas that we can conserve. And as John mentioned, we can remove the the threats that led to Arabian leopards going extinct from those areas in the first place, and then try to reintroduce them once we've been able to remove those threats, um, restore the natural prey, and also importantly work with local communities because leopards unfortunately tend not to stay where you put them. They will always, even if it's a fence protected area, they will find ways to get out. They will interact with the local community. So very important to put measures in place to try and manage those that potential conflict before it can happen. Thanks, Gad. And, and I think coming back to my initial question, which are, as you are, we, we understand, um, reintroducing a, a, a large carnivore is a very complex endeavor. It is risky uh, in terms of human wildlife conflict, not only by the possible effect on, on livestock, but on human life itself, uh, on, on, for some of the species we are, we are dealing with, this is sometimes a, a really real uh, issue that needs to take into consideration. And obviously it, it's challenging, it's complex, it takes time, it takes resources, it takes money, uh, and potentially it fails. Uh, However, very often in, in my career uh, working on animal reintroduction, what I was always puzzled and some, sometimes saddened from our own community is that one of the favored or most likely alternative to be pushed to reintroduction is simply to basically accept and resign ourselves to the fact that a species had disappeared from its former range and go on and just accept the fact. And that's really something I always fought against. Uh, I would say personally that no matter what the challenges and the difficulties and, and, and the cost, uh, we need to make an effort, all the effort we can to actually keep species in their natural habitat and not be satisfied ourselves of as long as we have some individual and some gene pool in captivity somewhere, this is good enough for us. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to share quickly to, to let my, my fellow panelists try to feel in their respective uh, field and things wh what they think about that. Because sometimes, yeah, resigning to the fact that we've lost the species in the wild might be an alternative. So I don't know who wants to, to comment or who have an idea on, on, on that. Fred, I can, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah. From the perspective of tigers, you know, it's, well, well first I'll, I'll say, I think you're spot on. We should be doing everything we can to repopulate species to their historic range. And there are, there are more reasons to do that beyond than just the species itself. And, and from the perspective of tigers, one of the things that um, we, we found is that forests with tigers in them are much better protected than those without. Once you lose your, your tigers, you tend to lose the other species in that forest and then the forest yourself, itself. Um, and that's because 
governments are much more willing to protect a forest for the sake of tigers than just for the, the forest itself. And then once you lose them, poachers start coming in, um, start poaching out all the wildlife, illegal logging starts happening, the forests are cut down, and eventually it's, it's turned into agricultural fields or, or developments. Um, so especially with species like wild cats, they're so charismatic that, that the public and governments um, are willing to invest in, they can be um, incredible tools for the conservation of everything, of forests, of, of biodiversity. And, and so there are reasons to protect species that go well beyond the species itself. Phil? Yeah, what, and, what, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to add a concrete example, maybe, you know, I mean, sometimes also that decision is almost on whether to do it or not, you know, is almost taken out of our hands a little bit because, I mean, these cats sometimes mm -hmm. do what they want anyways, right? I mean, so especially the males sometimes disperse over massive areas. We talked about the issues, you know, with, with human landscapes becoming too occupied with people too hostile, but sometimes males make it through. An example is Malawi as well, you know, a country where, where I don't work myself, I mean, but I know all the examples of where uh, the lion was extinct from the country um, for, for decades, you know, and then suddenly these male lions showed up from neighboring countries and then suddenly you're confronted with the question, okay, so what, what do we do with them now? Because, I mean, for females and big cats, it's much less likely that they're going to disperse over these long areas, long distances. Um, and so um, then in a way you have a situation where, um, yeah, I mean, you know, suddenly like one individual shows up and we have this example here in Gabon. To go back a little bit, maybe to give a little bit of context for this example in Gabon, I mean, Gabon, if, if listeners know it, you know, it's a country that people associate with rainforest, but it also has extensive savanna areas in the southeast of the country. And it's the same in neighboring Republic of Congo. And all these savanna areas were occupied by lion before. And uh, I actually, starting in 2001, yeah, led some of the first lion surveys in those landscapes. And there we established the absence of lions uh, in those savannas in, in uh, Gabon and neighboring Congo as well. Both countries, as a consequence, um, because all of these surveys were conducted with the wildlife authorities, um, scrubbed out the, the 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 species, the lion from their from their list of of, of species uh, that are protected, and um, uh, we considered really that lions were locally extirpated in both countries. But then suddenly, in 2015, um, a single lone male showed up uh, in Gabon um, in a national park, which was created after our first rounds of surveys in the early 2000s. And uh, we were then immediately called in as uh, the, the, the local experts uh, put up camera traps and yeah, documented the male line in that area. We're then asked to, to do a feasibility study uh, because immediately after it became public that one line was discovered in that area, the government partners here uh, from the Ministry of the Environment asked us, you know, can you help us uh, bring the species back? Um, can you figure out if there's just one, if there's several, if they're breeding? And we've been doing, yeah, since 2015, uh, intensive monitoring in that area. And uh, after two years of monitoring work, uh, we established uh, that unfortunately, it was really just this one male lion there. We um, collected genetic samples from that lion as well and um, traced uh, him back, did a lot of interview surveys as well, going into um, the Democratic Republic of Congo across the Congo River as well and found a tiny pocket um, of, of uh, habitat where lions seemingly uh, survived until, until about 2015. So we now think he came from that pocket and then did a 350 kilometer dispersal into Gabon. But yeah, no females ever showed up. But uh, yeah, the, the interest was there from the government. We did our feasibility study in the beginning. We said, no way. You know, I mean, we at the moment, we as Panthera wouldn't consider um, bringing more individuals into that area because our survey work did uh, uh, find that there was still a lot of poaching going on in that area, that uh, it was um, a bit of a surprise or even a miracle that our line made it through, uh, through that landscape um, and took up residence in a, in a small part of that national park, which was uh, uh, better protected just because there were geographic barriers to the, to the, to the areas where most poachers from that, from, that, from that area came from. 
And so there gradually, I mean, we have been asked by the government to then build up a park support program. Now we have with a lot of funding support from Line Recovery Fund, US Fish and Wildlife Service, SOS, IUCN, uh, invested in protection there. And, and now finally, five years, six years later, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a situation where uh, we, we, we ticked all the boxes in a way. I mean, we have uh, done a lot of work with the communities as well. Um, a lot of the elders in the communities, I mean, still, they, they still remember lines in that landscape vividly. And so we found some really good local support as well. And now we're finally in a position, you know, where we think, okay, we're ready. I mean, to bring in more individuals in that area. Now the area is prepared and safe to bring the line back. But it was a long journey and actually it, it was triggered, you know, by one animal coming in on his own and basically reintroducing the species itself uh, after 20 years of absence in Gabon. But but yeah, now we're working more on a translocation, as you as you explained it in the beginning, um, moving in additional lines to recreate um, a breeding population in that area, because uh, yeah, we, we, we definitely gave up hopes on yeah. having uh, enough lines in the wider landscape to have natural re-immigration from the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, and, and I think one, one other element that we need to, to take into consideration when we talk about large cat, uh, in addition to their invaluable values in the functioning ecosystem uh, as apex predators. They are also very often uh, f among the few species who are actually creating a magnet uh, from an identity perspective, but also from an economic perspective uh, there. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave Addison to, uh, to comment a little bit what we've seen, for example, in, in the Pantanal on the impact presence of a large carnivore like, like jaguar have on the local economy. So you can imagine when these animals disappear from the landscape, a, a big chunk of the potential income for the, the local population is actually gone. And that contributes also to now an increasing number of government of local community who would like to bring back some of these uh, apex predators. But uh, Alison, you can maybe elaborate a little bit more on, on, on that aspect of the uh, reintroduction. Sure thing. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, um, the Pantanal especially is, I think, a shining example of where jaguars are valued in specific regions where ecotourism has brought a new source of income for the local economy. So the majority of Pantanal is owned privately, dedicated to cattle ranching. About 80% is dedicated to higher intensity cattle ranching and less than 5% is in protected areas. And in regions where the ranches are jaguar friendly, they're not persecuting the jaguars or their prey, we have seen a shift in that local economy toward ecotourism. And that's offsetting the costs of livestock loss. And it's also bringing money in for infrastructure. As part of our work in the Northern Pantanal, in Joffrey region specifically, we are strategically placed right next to a uh, state park in Contra dos Aguas. Mm -hmm. And with the network along the Cuiaba River, we have a very healthy ecotourism, um, essentially economy. And there are many operators. It's been really fascinating to learn jaguar behaviors um, on the river because of the amount of citizen scientists that have contributed information on their observations and videos. And that's brought a lot of attention, um, not only locally, but also from the state level, national level in Brazil and internationally. And for this, we see a lot of people that want to see healthy jaguar populations and coexist. There is still human wildlife conflict. The local communities that live there year round do still suffer losses from livestock. And part of our work is examining different techniques that can mitigate those threats. So using, for example, night corrals, guard breeds, um, different management techniques, including electric fencing to protect cattle herds in specific areas to prevent those losses. So it's a constant engagement with local communities. And that's something I think Phil had mentioned is, especially with a reintroduction project, making sure that those communities are also involved because they will be the ones that will have the day-to-day -day 
interaction or potentially if conflict does arise, bear the burden of those costs. So making sure that we have mitigated those threats or addressed those or have a plan in place to help facilitate that coexistence. Um, also throughout Jaguar range, it is a component of the Jaguar 2030 roadmap to say that we want to have, if we do get to the point of needing a reintroduction, that we're very strategic. As Fred had mentioned, this is a lot of funding, it's a lot of logistics and effort, and it's a long-term initiative. Once you start on this, in order to ensure success, you need to be invested for the long term and working with um, local communities, especially. So being aware of that before starting into that process and even range countries have this integrated into national action plans. So it is something that um, on the level of our collaborators, we are aware of. Um, and as we were discussing, many regions do want to see these predators back. Um, they bring not only value to the ecosystem indicators for biodiversity, but they're also cultural icons. And especially throughout Jaguar range, we consider it not just the Jaguar corridor, but it's also in a way a cultural corridor. They have many different valuations throughout um, the entire range. So there's a, also an important part of that in conserving these large iconic big cat species. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, thanks. And, and finally, I will Alice, put Garrett on, on, on the spot because he's dealing with one of the most endangered, as I said before. So, so do, do you think that the countries in the Middle East, basically Oman, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia, should basically give up and uh, uh, just accept that they, they, they won't see Arabian leopard back in the wild, or at least not as it was before? I mean, Fred, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm extremely glad that they, that they haven't. Um, it's, I think the, what, what is quite the, the, the one good thing about the, the, the current, you know, the dire state that the Arabian leopard is in is that it does give us a real clarity of purpose um, regarding reintroduction because there, as I said, there's one stable population that we know about. If, if something happens to, to that population mm -hmm. due to climate change or an increase in um, conflict with, with local people, or, you know, it doesn't take a lot to, to push that one population down. So for the survival of the species, we need to take really drastic action quickly and again, because the, the Omani population is, is already, you know, so fragile, we, you know, we decided very early on that any reintroduction will have to come from, from the captive bred population, which obviously does make things a lot harder. In some cases, these leopards have been in captivity their whole lives mm -hmm. and probably aren't suitable to be reintroduced into the wild, but they, but you know, their, their cubs can be, and we can train them to, to hunt, to survive in the wild. And some of them will, will show that potential and others, you know, will, will probably have to remain as part of the, the breeding stock. But it does mean that, you know, we can, we can do this without really impacting on or risking negatively impacting on any wild populations. We can go ahead, we can you know, try and restore the Arabian leopards um, into Saudi Arabia. There's definitely a very strong desire from the government to do that. And it's an incredibly ambitious project, but one that they are really committed to and putting a huge amount of resources into, into making happen and really promoting. So it's very exciting. It's, it's great to be able to partner with, a, you know, with a, a sort of a government body, an organization that is that is um, committed to, to taking really sort of bold conservation steps like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. I think we had a, a, a good range of opinion and, and experience and, 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 and context. And I think, uh, so thank, thank you all for, for all your, your, your contribution. But I think now we can take some, some questions from, from, uh, from the audience uh, for, for the time we, we have left. All right, great. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thanks to everyone in our audience for staying with us and submitting questions. Uh, first, we have a question for Allison. 
Can you please describe Panthera's work to strengthen jaguar populations and habitats in Latin America? Sure thing, thank you. Um, so in terms of our proactive approaches in maintaining connectivity and viable populations, we have what's been developed and spearheaded um, by Alan Rabinowitz, Kathy Zeller, they published in 2010 about our Jaguar Corridor Initiative. This initially was established through a Jaguar Working Group, which brought together Jaguar experts from all over range in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where they identified core populations. And then after a genetic study by geneticist Eduardo Eiderich, um, that inspired Alan to say, these are a single species, there's no subspecies. Why don't we be ambitious, protect them from the northernmost population to the southernmost? And from that, through analyses, was where the Jaguar Corridor Initiative was born. And there was a Effort, a giant effort to ground truth those hypothesized corridors in Mesoamerica and also working within those core populations in South America. Um, in the past few years, we fortunately have um, worked with many great collaborators on developing the Jaguar 2030 roadmap, which is an, a joint effort from range countries. Um, we worked with experts in each range country to update the map gain insights into national action plans, and then coordinated with um, the United Nations, WCS, WWF, um, Panthera to establish the Jaguar 2030 committee. And it's been incredible um, having the roadmap itself and then gaining traction and implementing. And we've had most range countries sign on to support this effort. And it's ensuring that not only within range countries, but across borders, we're working to protect jaguars and ensure that safe passage for dispersers. And within that roadmap, we're identifying a suite of techniques um, generated from the best practices of experts from throughout jaguar range. And um, that includes mitigating human wildlife conflict, um, is ensuring habitat connectivity, mitigating the threats of illegal trade. Um, it's a suite of techniques that show um, best practices for long-term persistence of jaguar conservation. So, thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Allison. That's great. And next, we have a question for Gareth. Uh, Gareth, what would you say are the biggest barriers to reintroducing wildcat species? Uh oh, he might have lost internet. So we, Gareth, we'll come back to you. Um, next, I'll uh, kick it over to John. Um, John, how does reintroducing a wildcat species enhance biodiversity? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Good question. Um, boy, there's a lot of ways, but, but, but perhaps one of the most important is cats, especially big cats, are what we call keystone species. They're at the top of the food chain, and they have a really profound influence on species of, of animals and even plants below them on the food chain. Um, and so when you restore a cat population, you're restoring that entire food chain. It will, in, obviously you need, you know, if you're gonna reintroduce cats and restore a cat population, you have to have a good prey population. Prey influence there have, can have big influences on their habitat. And so you can see this real ripple effect through the in, entire ecosystem where you actually by restoring a cat population can restore all biodiversity, including both plants and animals. Thank you, John. All right, and uh, last um, when this is a question for Phil, uh, when a wildcat is reintroduced to an ecosystem, what are the ways in which the ecosystem is impacted? Um, yeah, th thanks, Kelly. I mean, I think it's a bit linked, I mean, to um, the question uh, John uh, just answered. I mean, because obviously, you know, biodiversity is, is a component of, of the ecosystem. And uh, to, to be quite honest, you know, I mean, like for big cats, uh, the species that we're covering today, 
the exact impacts on an ecosystem, it's not yet that well studied because unfortunately, you know, we're more often confronted with the situation where the big cats are lost and not where they're being restored. I mean, as Fred mentioned in the beginning, lions, uh, there are some examples of lion uh, reintroductions into a number of uh, places. Uh, but most of this has been in South Africa um, and, and all of these cases uh, that was uh, generally uh, relatively small fence reserves uh, that are stuck to the rim um, with, uh, with prey species. And uh, so these are not really like big natural systems. Uh, what we have though is unfortunately because big cats disappeared from a number of systems, we have several examples of what actually happens um, when a big cat is removed from a system by, by becoming locally extirpated. And, and so uh, there are a few examples of then how ecosystems have been deregulated, basically. One, one really good example, I think, is uh, studies that have been done in Ghana. Uh, I mentioned Ghana in the, in the, uh, before in, in this chat and this exchange about a possible site for bringing lions back. But there, actually, because the Ghana Wildlife Division did general wildlife monitoring uh, for decades, um, they uh, recorded um, the distribution and abundance um, yeah, of all species present in the Ghana protected areas. Um, and then uh, researchers used these data sets and compared basically what happened to other species and the, and the landscape itself. Um, uh, before and, and, and uh, then uh, after uh, the disappearance of lions. And what they found is that some species increased dramatically and the most uh, after the lion was removed. And the most dramatic increase was actually the baboon um, or primate species, um, which increased four to five fold in some of these protected areas, became hyperabundant. And that then led in turn to a lot of uh, crop raiding by baboons outside uh, these protected areas. So incurring very high cost to the local communities. Um, and what also happened is because what some people don't know, baboons also, they're very uh, proficient predators of uh, fawns, of uh, antelope young um, that uh, are yeah, hidden by the, by, the, by, the, by the females in the long grasses. Um, and uh, the baboons, I mean, with their keen eyes and large numbers, they, they really make that out very effectively. And so they have basically stopped the reproduction of, uh, of certain ungulate species, leading to a crash in ungulate popula populations. And so there were these dramatic effects that have been documented, which are potentially res reversed to a certain extent if we bring big cats back. I mean, but we, we haven't gone yet so far. But I mean, we have ample examples now of how a system can also be deregulated after the top predator uh, has been lost uh, in the system. Thank you, Phil. That's really helpful. All right. And Gareth, it looks like you're back with us. Um, I'm going to ask you this question again um what are the biggest barriers to reintroducing wildcat species uh thanks kelly i hope i hope i can you know, make it through without breaking up this time um as as john mentioned i think one of the one of the key things is combating the reasons why the the cats went extinct in the first place um the challenge is that often we don't know precisely why uh, we, you know, it's often these cats, particularly things like leopards or, or jaguars, can disappear without people really knowing. And it's often not one thing; it's a combination of factors. So it's, it might be um, conflict with people, it might be environmental degradation, it might be habitat destruction, it might be a loss of the prey base. Um, so it's often really complicated, and so it's seldom a case of just identifying one issue. So it's firstly trying to identify what the, the key um, barriers are to, to reintroducing that animal um, from a purely environmental sense. And then obviously it's heavily reliant on, on supports, um, be it from particularly um, from, you, you need to have buy-in from local communities, from, from local governments as well. I mean, as, as Philip mentioned, the, you know, the lion finding its way into the barn really catalyzed a lot of interest from the, the Gabonese um, conservation authorities, which you know, probably would not have happened had, had the lion not, not made its way there. Um, but without the, the support, you know, that interest from the authorities, it's unlikely that you'd be able to really you know, capitalize on, on that event. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, 
the yeah, the I mean the other main barriers are often just just fairly subtle things. It's it can be um, just yeah economic factors. Often the the things that cause um, cats to go extinct are, are human developments. It can be development of roads, a flooding of habitat for dams. Um, these are often not things that we can simply get rid of. We have to try and somehow mitigate the impact of those. And again, that's that's also um, quite a you know, quite a difficult thing to do often, and you know we often have might have to accept that we are reintroducing animals into what's not the kind of pristine wilderness that we'd like, but it is still an environment in which they have a good shot at survival, and yeah, it's it's a, a decent um, compromise option. Thank you, Gareth, and great use of uh, our campaign name, Catalyst. Um, I know we're running out of time, everyone, uh, but before we go, um, we want to let you know that you too can catalyze change for wild cats by making a donation to Panthera. Uh, you can just visit panthera.org slash be the catalyst. And from now until the end of the year, all donations will be matched dollar for dollar. Uh, if you want to learn more about Panthera, you can follow at Panthera Cats on all social media channels. I want to thank everyone again for tuning in and I hand it over to Fred to close us out. Yeah, so well, thank you very much for everybody and uh, uh, who, who listened to, to that uh, live session. I hope it was informative. I mean, certainly we could talk for hours again on, on reintroduction and, and what it takes, how challenging it is and uh, what Pantera is doing about it. And I'm sure uh, if you contact us through our uh, email at Pantera, we will be keen to uh, answer uh, further questions that you, you might have. I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting topic. It's certainly very important now uh, and very timely. Uh, whilst 20 years ago, reintroduction of large apex carnivore was really something of a taboo in the conservation community. It is now increasingly uh, part of the panel of, of action solution we might have. Um, it is to some extent uh, sad to, to reach that point because uh, reintroduction are needed when nearly all other action have failed. Uh, but it's also a testimony of how we are uh, resilient and, and ready to be very pragmatic in our effort as, as conservation practitioner to do everything we can to actually restore healthy population of carnivores in the wild. So thank you very much, and I hope to be able to interact with you uh, in the future. <laughs>